happening. Uh, speaking about um, Russian uh, sub-imperialism uh, and uh, also just taking an issue like Chavez or Russian opposition to NATO and so on. Uh, of course, uh, that also creates a situation when uh, the left, or at least some progressives, they, they basically share the, the policies of the government. When Putin says something uh, against uh, NATO uh, enlargement, why should I be against it? Against Putin, I mean. Why should I be against Putin? I agree, it's bad when NATO is, is expanding. Or when Putin is saying that we uh, are opposing uh, their uh, installation of American missiles uh, in Eastern Europe, there is no reason uh, for us to oppose Putin on this issue. And uh, uh, of course, the reason why they are saying that is completely different from the reason we are saying that. But tactically, it's. Uh, uh, it will be absurd not to use these opportunities and not to support these moves. Uh, ironically, that actually increased the media presence of the left because they also allow us to speak out in public <coughs> on these matters, including on government television, for example, or in the mainstream press. Uh, because at least they know that we say that honestly, not because we are paid like they're all journalists. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's why we are much more convincing. I'm just telling you the story where I just discussed with one guy from the administration asked this question. Why, why are you inviting me to talk about these issues? You have crowds of people who will do it. So they'll do it for money. You'll do it for because you really think it. <laughs> uh, so uh, the same thing about Chavez and so on. So in that sense, of course, uh, Russian sub-imperialism has a positive side to it. But you should not forget where it comes from. You know? uh, so saying that there is a tactical element which we should use is not like saying that we have to share their vision of uh, empire which must dominate the former Soviet area. Um, speaking about agriculture, uh, actually agribusiness in Russia is flourishing. Uh, capitalist transformation of agriculture and, uh, and rural society is taking place. And Russia is now exporting corn. It's now, I think, third or maybe fourth major corn exporter in the world already. Uh, though I don't know about this current year because I don't know how, how good or bad their, their harvest is going to be, but Russia is exporting. However, uh, that didn't stop the decay of their rural society. Because very often these agribusinesses are disconnected from the rural society around them. Very often they bring in people from elsewhere, like they bring in urban unemployed people to work in the fields. Well, there are peasants there, but these peasants are considered to be unreliable because they drink too much or they, they don't know the, the modern techniques and so on. And anyhow, they, they consider that probably politically or socially a better approach, just to bring in people and take them away, rather than to negotiate with locals. And uh, in a certain sense, the success of Russian agribusiness actually uh, is increasing and speeding up the decay of the village uh, society. Uh, but still, there is a capitalist agricultural uh, enterprise in Russia. Uh, Okay. Yeah, uh, take two minutes. Yeah, okay. Oh, uh, okay, it still happens. Uh, Gazprom. Actually, Gazprom is not nationalized. Uh, it, it, if somebody says it's a public corporation, it's not. Uh, it has 40% shares belonging to the government. Uh, but in fact, I should say, uh, whether it's 40% uh, government property or the government is 40% the Gazprom property, mm. <laughs> you know, there is no mechanism through which the government can control Gazprom. <laughs> Expect, expect sending one of the top bureaucrats to become uh, a top executive in Gazprom and just have another, yet another share, uh, uh, another salary, and, uh, and have some some shares individually. Yeah? So, which, because these people who are government bureaucrats who represent the state in Gazprom, they're also shareholders themselves individually. 
So, so this is a, a very strange case of, of nationalization. If it is. Uh, the unions, how big are the unions? The new unions are still rather small. They're in dramatically growing areas, the strategic areas, like uh, say automobile production or, uh, or in, in the mining uh, or bauxite mining, which is important for aluminum. Uh, some, they're, they're now trying to make inroads uh, uh, with their, with their uh, oil industry. So they're very important strategically. But in terms of numbers, of course, they're much smaller than the old union. And, uh, well, at this stage, the people, the number of people who are more or less involved in organized labor movement, the new free trade union movement, uh, they are about 300,000 people. Uh, of course, uh, if we invite a labor leader, he will probably speak about 1.5 million. But, I mean, these are 1.5 million people who actually gave their names uh, for the unions to be registered and so on, but the actual number of people who are active in the unions are about 300,000 people, but still it's a lot of people. And uh, I don't think we are going to form a labor party or a party based on trade unions. I think that uh, this orientation towards labor is very important for the identification of the left-wing project, for, for, the, for the formulation of its class nature. But actually, I don't think it's... Uh, some kind of labor party to be built, or a new labor, well, not, not no new labor in the English sense, of course, but no. you, you, not even the new old labor party to be built. You know? <laughs> uh, what we need is, is a new militant left wing party, but it has to be connected with the labor movement. That's the idea. And this, by the, speaking about the challenges, this is exactly the major debate whether we need, what kind of party we need to build. This is what, what we need to do. Thank you, Bert. Exactly the point uh, we are we are at here <laughs> with these kinds of questions. So it's the perfect point to end. Thank you very much. Next.